Good evening. I'm happy to have another opportunity to study with you in the book of Revelation. In the lesson this evening, we want to start uh, with the opening greeting that's found in chapter 1 and verses 4 through 7, and then continue on uh, through the end of the chapter and see the things that the Lord uh, revealed to John, and that was to strengthen the church for the troublesome times that they had ahead. The opening greeting um, is in verses 4 through 7. We'll just read the greeting together, then we'll break it down and look at it uh, verse by verse and phrase by phrase. You might just see, first of all, that it's a greeting that comes from the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. And that Jesus is the first or the last one to be mentioned and, of course, uh, is most directly associated with the revelation that's given to John. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. And to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, as we look at uh, what is stated there uh, by John, let's look in a little more detail at the things that are revealed to us. In verse 4, it's written to the seven churches that are in Asia. So out of all of the congregations in the world, those seven that are in Asia Minor, which would be the eastern, uh, western part of Turkey, is where Asia Minor was located, maybe southwest uh, Turkey today. And these are not the only churches that were in that area. When we think of churches like Troas and um, other congregations, but these seven uh, are used representatively, at least, for the church everywhere. And, of course, they have uh, different uh, characteristics that are associated with them that um, would kind of represent the problems that you'd find in most every kind of church. So we have seven different uh, churches with different problems that are, are being addressed. So they're in the western provinces there. Uh, seven churches are, are selected, uh, probably because of that symbolic number. It's used 54 times in the book. It's a perfect number. It's a symbolic number for completeness or fullness. Uh, these are perfect representatives of the conditions that are found in different congregations. And the Lord is sending uh, this book to those seven churches to help them be prepared for the tribulation and the problems that they face and help them to correct the things that are wrong. Uh, like in the other letters of the New Testament, uh, they're greeted with grace and peace. Uh, it's a typical New Testament greeting. Grace is unmerited favor. Uh, peace has to do with everything being all right with you. It's used in a spiritual sense to talk about our salvation and reconciliation with God that our, we might uh, be right with God and be well and have all the blessings that come from that, that we might have spiritual prosperity. This is being addressed from the Eternal Father uh, that this letter is coming from. So the Eternal Father is he who was and is and is to come. It's much like... Uh, the term that you would use in the Old Testament for God that is given, Elohim, uh, is God. Jehovah is I am, uh, the ever-present God. And the Holy Father is eternal. And he's always been, is, and always will be. And he's seen kingdoms rise. He's seen kingdoms fall. He's seen uh, people go through trials and struggles like uh the church was going to be going through in this tribulation with the Romans, and he'd heard all of the brags that mighty 
kings of uh, Babylon and Persia and uh, different kingdoms of the past had made, and he'd see them also be brought down and uh, sent to Hades. So uh, he's seen it all, and he is the one that is behind um, this letter and behind our Lord Jesus Christ. So the letter comes also with his endorsement, uh, the things that are written in this book. Uh, the seven spirits uh, that are before the throne of God. It is a figure that's used in the book of Zechariah to talk about the Holy Spirit um, and the sevenfold perfection of spirit. It'd be a way to uh, symbolically picture the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is working with the church through the word and uh, he is also behind this letter so the fullness of the spirit is there um, and thinking about the letter he also goes on to say that it's from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood so Jesus Christ is the faithful witness that sends this letter to the churches uh, all that he has to say is amen, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He is always faithful. He never lies. He's the one that promises us victory and security and that all things are going to uh, go well in the end. And so we can give him complete trust because he is a prophet of God, the ultimate prophet. And uh, he is the one that is always truthful in the things that he delivered. He came to uh, preach the truth, and those that are of the truth hear him and follow him. And all of his testimonies are true that he receives from the Father. He is the firstborn of the dead. So if you were one that's being persecuted, being threatened with being beheaded for not worshiping Caesar and receiving his mark, uh, wouldn't it be great encouragement to know that you have a letter that comes from God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, who is the firstborn of the dead. He has been resurrected from the dead already. He lives. We have a living Savior that we serve that has already gone through death and come out victorious. He is, uh, as firstborn, preeminent. That The firstborn is used in a figurative sense of the one that has preeminence in the family and over all of the dead since he is the firstborn of the dead he's able to deliver all who uh, have fear of death he died for us so that he might deliver us from death he rose from the dead in order to give us hope uh, of a resurrection and to assure us of that resurrection he, he gives encouragement to everyone who might have to die for jesus so very encouraging words that are given to us. Jesus has risen from the dead and overcome death. He's ascended to heaven and is sat down at the right hand of God. So John says that it comes from the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is ruling over the kings of the earth right now. Those that crucified Jesus are now subject to him. When he came up to the disciples uh, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We should believe that. This, this uh, greeting reminds the saints that Jesus Christ is the one that actually rules over this world. All of these persecutors could be brought to an end at any time. God has made him his firstborn, and he can bring these kings to an end at any time that he decides and he'll deal with Rome in his appointed time. The world may be messed up, but it doesn't disprove that Jesus Christ is king and ruler. Some people that want to deny that the kingdom or rule of Christ is present right now, uh, as it's taught in the New Testament, Paul said, we've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. We're in the kingdom right now. Jesus is ruling and reigning and has all of that authority in heaven and on earth. Just because things are messed up doesn't mean that he's not uh, presently ruling. And from Jesus Christ, 
the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. So John says this letter again is written from him who is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is been exalted to the right hand of God after his resurrection, and he sits as king at the right hand of God. All authority is given to him in heaven and on earth in Matthew 28 and verse 18. So Jesus is the ruler over the earth. The people that crucified him are now his subjects. Uh, he is in charge over all of these persecutors. He is the ultimate authority, and he can remove them at any time he might choose. The world being messed up and having all kinds of problems in it does not mean that Jesus is not ruling now. Any more than it meant it back in the Old Testament days when Nebuchadnezzar was ruling over the Babylonian kingdom. One of the emphasis of the book of Daniel is that God is the ruler over all of the kings of the earth, and he raises up kings and brings them down. And even though the world may be in great disorder, it does not mean that God was not ruling and reigning during that time. And it doesn't mean that Jesus Christ isn't ruling in the days of the Roman Empire when the church was being persecuted. God had his purpose, Christ had his purpose to let that persecution go forward and to let those trials happen. Uh, and when his purpose was fulfilled and the time was right, he was going to remove that persecuting power. He is ruling and reigning today. And he allows things to happen in all of the different messed up ways that they are as men exercise their free will and live here under the sun according to his purpose. And so we don't question that Jesus Christ is ruling because there's problems in the world. God, according to his purpose, allows these things to go forward until his, according to his purpose, he decides that things are going to change. So Jesus Christ was ruling uh, just as God the Father had been ruling during the Old Testament times with all of the different trials and struggles that went on. So we need to trust in Jesus Christ and that he's ruling and that his will will be done and that it's our duty to keep ourselves pure from the world and to be loyal to him and that according to his purpose, all things are going to work out. And in the end, we're going to see that what he willed and purposed was right. So the letter is from him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So this ruler over um, heaven and earth and over the church, uh, he's one that loves us right now. He loved the church, even though they were going through persecution. They should recognize that none of these trials can separate them from the love of Christ. And Jesus Christ loved them and cared about their souls and was interested in their eternal well-being and that's something we need to trust. He demonstrated to all of us and to them that he loves us by laying down his life for us. No greater love can anybody show than to lay down his life for his friends. And he had laid down his life for the church. He had purchased them out of the greatest bondage of all, that bondage from sin. He'd released them from their sins and did so by giving his life's blood as an atonement for them so that they might uh, be free from sin, its condemnation, its power, its guilt. And so in the midst of persecution and trial, whatever may come, these brethren and all of us should remember that Jesus Christ loved us and he died for our sins. In verse 6, And he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, and to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what has uh, all of us Christians, all of us uh, uh, that are saved in Christ, we were made a kingdom. So the church is a kingdom, a loyal kingdom to Jesus Christ, and it has many uh, privileges in it. As individuals, we're represented as priests to God the Father. Every Christian is a priest. So the redeemed from sin, they've been made a new and better kingdom, a new and better spiritual Israel. Just like 
he uh, said at Mount Sinai that he was going to make them a, a separate nation and a, and a kingdom of priests. Well, even in a fuller sense, it is so with the church that we are a kingdom with all of the blessings that we belong to God and enjoy all of the benefits of Christ's reign and have many wonderful things yet to come. As priests, we offer sacrifices. We're able to approach God and acceptably come before him because of Jesus Christ. And we're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 5, that we are a holy priesthood that comes before the Lord, and we offer up our spiritual sacrifices. Hebrews 13, 15, we offer up the fruit of our lips in praise to God is part of our spiritual sacrifices. In Romans 12, 1, we give our bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord in the way that we serve him every day. So we serve the Father. We serve God. We serve our Redeemer. We don't serve um, as the first priority uh, the kingdom of Caesar, and certainly we don't worship Caesar as God. So we need to remember who it is that we're dealing with and stay loyal. We give to Caesar those things that belong to Caesar, but we give to God the things that belong to God. And Caesar or no government can require that we worship them. It says that he is one that should be praised. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So to Jesus Christ be glory, be dominion forever and ever. Glory is, in its basic meaning, brightness, splendor, brilliance. It stands for praise. It's used to talk about someone being of good repute, uh, something that excites your admiration, that brings honor and renown, and to Jesus belongs all of those things because of his great excellence. And dominion. Dominion is a word that basically means strength, power, might, rule, and sovereignty. When it comes to ruling over heaven and earth, he deserves all the dominion. And it perfectly fulfills what we studied when we looked at Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Through heaven's point of view, you see the ascension of Christ, the Son of Man, coming up to the Ancient of Days to receive kingdom and glory and power. And Christ has received all of those things. And it's pictured here again in this uh, uh, benediction, this uh, doxology of praise that is given to Jesus Christ. And he rules forever and ever. Ages unto the ages. Unending, unlimited duration. That term is used 12 times in the book of Revelation for different things. And uh, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign until he delivers the kingdom up on to the Father on Resurrection Day. And then in some way, even probably beyond our comprehension, he'll be still uh, sharing in as part of the Godhead um, dominion. And John says, Amen. And all the church ought to say, Amen. It's an expression of certainty that he is deserving of all of those things. And we say it too. And so at the end of a prayer, at the end of some doxology of praise, uh, Christians would say, Amen. I say it too. Let it be so. And verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the earth will mourn over him. Even so. Amen. So Jesus Christ is he that is coming. He's coming in the clouds. He went in the clouds in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. It says here that every eye will see him. There's not going to be some secret rapture where only certain ones are going to see him, but everyone is going to see him when he comes. He's going to come with the shout, with the trumpet of God, we're told in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. All his enemies are going to, on that day, suffer uh, everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. And every knee will bow on that day. They'll all recognize that Jesus Christ is ruling. Only John records this piercing of Jesus by the Roman soldiers. And he uses the same word in John 19, 37, 
that is used here about those who pierced him are going to see him. Um, they're going to be beating their heads or their breast and lamenting in hopelessness when they see the Lord coming uh, in judgment. Even so, amen is the, again, double endorsement that is given. Amen, amen. Even so, amen. This is so, that every eye will see him. It's pointed out that this idea of the coming of the Lord in the clouds is a common figure in Bible prophecies to talk about the Lord coming in judgment against Egypt or Babylon or coming in Matthew 24 at the destruction of Jerusalem. He comes in the clouds. You know, one that comes on the clouds is unstoppable, uh, can't be resisted, and it's often associated with the comings of God in time. This uh, passage, it's difficult to decide. Is it talking just about the second coming of Christ? Or is it talking about all of those uh, comings of the Lord even before that time? I think in this context with every eye seeing him, even those that pierced him, uh, I, I think I apply it to, in this passage, the second coming. But it'll be used in you know, temporal judgments that are going to come on the Roman Empire as you go through the book. It'll be used in that way. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So the seal of God is placed on this book. Uh, God the Father is the Alpha and the Omega, the first letter and the last letter in the Greek alphabet. He is the full and complete um, God who is standing behind, giving his uh, stamp of approval to this book in Revelation the eternal one, the ever-present God, the Almighty is the approver and the origin of this revelation. So again, the Father and the Son are one. They stand, He stands completely behind everything the Spirit and the Son do. And the Father speaks here. And then again at the end of the book, we see the Father speak. In verses 9 through 11, John is commanded to write the things that are recorded in the book, the things that he hears and the things that he sees. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, who's on the isle called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So let's look a little more closely at verse 9. I, John, so he mentions himself again, that John is our brother. Uh, says, I'm your brother, your fellow partaker in all of these things, these tribulations and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus so John is their brother. He is also one that shares uh, in this tribulation. This tribulation is, tribulation is pressure that is put on something that crushes it, makes it more usable, was done to uh, the grapes in order to make uh, uh, the fruit of the vine. It's used to crush grain, uh, to separate the grain from the husk and so on. And it was used to talk about the pressure and trials that are put on us by persecutors or by affliction. And it makes us more useful. We're in this world. We're going to have tribulation. But uh, don't fear. Christ has overcome the world. We're told in John 16, uh, In the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom, you must pass through many tribulations before you come to the heavenly phase of the kingdom of God, Paul told the churches. So they are partakers. John is sharing with them in this tribulation, and he is a sharer in all of the blessings that are a part of God's rule, Christ's rule, and he is a sharer in this perseverance that they have to have uh, in order to prove their character and to come off victorious uh, perseverance is steadfast endurance. It's hanging in there in the face of trial 
and overcoming. You know, you hang in there to victory when you have perseverance. All of these things are described as being in Christ, in connection with Christ. We're having this tribulation. It's because of our loyalty to him. It's because of him that we're able to share in the blessings of the kingdom, and it's through him and by him that we're able to endure and persevere to victory in the end. John says that he was on the isle called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Patmos is about 70 miles southwest of Ephesus, about 40 miles from Miletus, the seaport that's just south of uh, uh, Ephesus, where Paul met the elders on his third missionary journey, uh, about 24 miles straight across from the coast of Asia Minor. So the island itself, you can picture it 10 miles long and uh, about six miles wide is at its closest uh, or its widest point. And, you know, kind of in the middle, it has a almost is pinched in two where there's a harbor uh, for the island. And John, he says, had been, um, he says he was, he was on the island. So it gives you the idea that that's where he was at the time he received this revelation. And maybe he's no longer there. It's in the aorist tense for this one time in the past he was there. But now uh, that's no longer true because of the word of God. So he'd been exiled there because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That same phrase is used about those that were beheaded because of the word of God and their souls were under the altar. And uh, so it's used of persecution because of the word of God. He had been exiled to hard labor there on the island. And looking at the next verse, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit speaks about one that is under the influence and control of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he is able then to see visions and to receive this divine revelation that's given to him. So it's not just talking about he was in a religious frame of mind, but he was under the influence of the Holy Spirit like Ezekiel was when he saw his visions and when he was caught up and carried from one place to another uh, in his mind by the Holy Spirit and by visions. And the same thing is said here about John, that he received this divine revelation. He uses the description, the Lord's Day. It's the one time in the New Testament that the first day of the week is referred to as the Lord's Day. It's the day belonging to the Lord. It's the same expression there for Lord's Day that you have with Lord's Supper, the supper that especially belongs and is connected with the Lord. We know from the writings of the early Christians of the second century, um, Eusebius um, from from that historian, that the first day of the week is the Lord's day. That's the day that they uh, heard the gospel proclaimed for the first time on the day of Pentecost, which always falls on the first day of the week when the Holy Spirit came, when they laid by in store and gave into the treasury of the church on the first day of every week. That's when they took the Lord's Supper. They gathered together to break bread on the first day of the week. That's the Lord's day, the day especially set aside for our worship of the Lord and remembering his resurrection and his sacrifice for our sins and to have a time of worship and, and edification. It's the Lord's Day. So it's said by Justin Martyr that that was the first day of the week. Um, several different writers during the second century in their writings called the Lord's Day the first day of the week. They're the same. So we know what day is the Lord's Day. On that day, he heard a loud voice behind him to grab his attention. It was a voice like a trumpet. A uh, similar voice and call uh, was heard by Ezekiel. It was a loud trumpet sound that was heard at Mount Sinai when God was about to speak. A trumpet is oftentimes used uh, to announce things, to call attention, um, 
we still uh, hear that sound in the military to wake up in the morning and to uh, uh, close the day. And it was used, of course, to get your attention, to call a charge, to give orders. And so there's a loud, clear sound of a voice that's like a trumpet that spoke to John to grab his attention. Uh, the voice is either an angel, because the revelation of Jesus Christ came through an angel that calls John's attention. That's probably right. Or to Jesus. We know Jesus speaks in the last part of the chapter in the vision that's given to him. He tells him that he should write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. So he was to write this out. They usually wrote on papyrus leaves that were uh, stuck together and were in a roll of about uh, 15 feet that would cover the whole book of Revelation. So he wrote out in the scroll and then he sent it to the seven churches, circulated it to them. And it would first sort of went to Ephesus, and then it would have started, you know, going around to those seven churches. So it had a circuit to send the letter on. And each of those letters, when they received this one book that John had written, was their practice, we see in the book of Colossians, to copy the book and keep a copy of it for themselves. And then send it on to the next church so that they might read it and copy it and uh, receive its revelation for them. The seven churches that are mentioned here were seven, seven literal churches, but, you know, seven is chosen probably for symbolic reasons. And as I say, they kind of represent the whole church that was throughout the world at that time. And, of course, eventually the letter would be carried to all of those other congregations. And they're kind of symbolic of the different characteristics that you find in churches throughout this time that we live in until Christ comes again. So to the seven churches, send this letter. Then you come to uh, the vision of Christ, his majesty and glory that are described in verses 12 through 16. The vision, Christ's majesty and glory is revealed to John. He sees seven lampstands and Christ in the middle of the lampstands. Verses 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in robe, reaching to his feet. And girded around his breast was a golden girdle. So Christ uh, is pictured there among the seven lampstands that are hold, holding up lampstands. Let's look at this in more detail. The seven golden lampstands. Uh, are representative of the seven churches. Uh, gold was the vessel that was used in divine service. Each of the things in the tabernacle in the Old Testament was covered in gold, whether it was the, you know, the uh, lampstand or the table of showbread or the altar of burnt offerings inside the temple of Solomon. Everything was covered in gold to represent the glories of heaven and the glories of God. And so these lampstands that represent the churches are made of gold. Uh, each light is an individual uh, pedestal. Uh, each stand has a lamp on the top to represent each of these independent congregations that are those that have as their mission to uphold uh, the light of the gospel and to let it shine. Uh, there are all independent congregations, probably with their own eldership, like we find in the New Testament. But they are joined in the sense that they all share a united faith and one head, Jesus Christ. And they have a duty, and that is to let the light of truth shine. And each, each congregation lets the light shine to the greatest extent that they can, according to God's plan. Of course, uh, Christ is in the middle of these lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet and girded around his breast with a golden girdle. So Christ is in the middle of the lampstands. Jesus is in uh, fellowship with these congregations. He uh, is one that is the controlling force, the sustaining power for all of these congregations. He 
is with them. He's aware of their conduct. He knows what all of their problems are. He is one that is pictured um, like a son of man. Uh, that is used in the book of Daniel to prophesy about the coming of the Messiah, that he is one like a son of man. It's used by Jesus himself 82 times in the Gospels to describe himself. He is the Messiah, and he shares our human nature with us. Now he has been glorified, but he is with us even to the end of the age, and he's found in the midst of these lampstands that represent the church. And he is clothed with a robe that reaches to his feet, and there's a girdle around his breast, and it's a golden girdle that he has. So again, you have this picture of Christ uh, in this long robe like the high priest would wear. And it represented somebody, of course, of great dignity and high office, this long robe, and then the golden girdle. We're told by uh, Edersheim uh, that the high priest would wear this uh, on the day that he was put in office, on the day that of atonement, uh, he would wear this uh, special robe. So it was only put on in times that he was serving uh, the people. And Jesus Christ appears in the same way. The same kind of robe and dignity is seen by the seven angels uh, later in the book. So he has this golden girdle and this special uh, robe like a high priest that he appears in. Then in verses 14 through 16, And his head and his hair were, like, were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze. And when it has been caused to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. What an awesome picture of Christ that is given. It says that uh, his head and his hair were white like white wool. His head and his hair uh, were like snow. Uh, it reminds you of the Ancient of Days as he's pictured on his throne in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. Uh, he is ancient. He is one that is holy and pure and has great dignity. That's what crowns uh, the head of Christ as he's pictured in his glorified uh, state. And he has eyes that are like a flame of fire. Uh, this doesn't stress tenderness, does it? But they're, they're fierce. They're piercing. They're consuming his stare, uh, penetrating, burning deeply. We know that the Word of God uh, and the one we have to do with uh, can read the intent and thoughts of our heart. Jesus was able to tell people what they were thinking in their hearts, and he has eyes that are a flame of fire. He sees into the hearts and souls of every congregation, every member of the church, and in the hearts of all men. And this fire flashes from his eyes with, with wrath, maybe, with righteous indignation like he had when he uh, was about to heal the man with the withered hand as he looked about at all of that hypocrisy that was going on. Uh, all things become light and nothing can be concealed from his eyes. What would be more awe-inspiring than to see this vision of Christ with these flaming, flaming eyes? He is the one that uh, loved us and gave himself for us as looking out for us. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. So his feet were like this burnished bronze, uh, this mixture of metal and uh, brass or bronze mixed together and, and just glowing, uh, you know, red with heat. Uh, just like the flame while it's still, or the metal when it's still in the crucible being heated up and about to be you know, poured out. They still have that quality. He's able to tread underfoot, uh, you know, all of his enemies, turn them to ashes, and he's going to trample the wicked under feet, we're told in Malachi 4 and verse 3. And he's really awesome, unstoppable wherever he 
walks and treads. He comes with strength and speed to trample down all of these that are enemies of his church and to come to the rescue of those that are righteous. So great picture is given there. And his voice, it says, was like the sound of many waters. You think about uh, the roar of the ocean and how it sounds when those great waves uh, explode against the rocks. That kind of loudness and power was coming from the voice of Christ as he spoke. Power of a flooding river are like the waters flowing down from Niagara, you know, constantly. Uh, so is the voice of God at Mount Sinai and hear the voice of Christ as he is speaking to John. Very powerful, strong, and resolute in all the things that he has to say. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So in his right hand he has seven stars that he's holding. We're told later in the chapter that these are the angels of the churches that are in his right hand. And in his right hand is majestic power and strength is what's represented by the arm and hand of God. And he is holding in those hands that can uphold the whole universe, he's holding uh, the angel of the churches. And it, they're pictured as stars, as jewels that are strung together maybe and protected uh, by his power. Isn't that an awesome picture again about how Christ is right in the midst of the churches? Wouldn't that give you encouragement in days of persecution? And we're told that out of his mouth, came a sharp two-edged sword, and his, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, uh, this sword of uh, judgment that comes forth from his mouth to utter uh, and pronounce judgment upon nations and men, uh, and whatever judgment he pronounces, because it is the word of God, and he always speaks the truth and never lies, it always comes to pass. So you don't want judgment and condemnation pronounced from God uh, through Christ, uh, through the prophets. And uh, this great sword is the type of sword that is used. Not the short sword like a Roman soldier would, would wield, but a Thracian sword that was long and heavy. It's found uh, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 35 where Simeon told Mary that she was going to be, have her heart pierced with a sword someday. He would see Christ crucified and uh, rejected to pierce her heart. So it was a, a, a symbol there of anguish to her. Two times it's used against the church, the sword that is in Christ's mouth to condemn, uh, compromise, and falseness in the church and different people. Two times it's used for judgment against the world in chapter 19 and verse 15 and verse 21 of chapter 19. Once it refers to the slaughtered saints that had been beheaded with a sword. Uh, and it's parallel really in this context, the sword coming out of his mouth, like uh, the rod of his mouth that he uses to smash the nations in Isaiah 11, 4. His readiness to judge and do battle is represented by the words of his mouth. And of course, that's all it needs is a word from God to create the universe and the different parts of it and to be able to bring down his enemies. And he is one, again, that has come uh, to wage war. So this idea is a sword coming out of his mouth uh, to fight against the evils that are plaguing and uh harming his church. His word is able to pierce through all of these lying errors and self-deception that these uh, Romans and those that are compromising in their religion have. He's able to judge between good and evil, false and true. The proconsuls had the power of the sword, the power of life and death to put to death uh, Christians that uh, wouldn't bow the knee and offer incense to Caesar. But let's remember there's one that John sees in this vision that's much greater than any, any governor, proconsul, or Caesar himself. And Christ has a greater sword. He has the final word, and he's the one that we should stay loyal to in all things. His face shone like the sun 
in its strength. So you think about the sun at noontime shining. Well, if you look up at it and you, you kept your eyes on it for more than a, a, a moment, it did it burn your retina out and blind you. Think about the face of Christ in this vision, shining with that kind of glory and intensity to show his divinity, to show his uh, spiritual uh, glory in his nature. So he's shining in his face. This is brilliant in the sun. It re reminds you of the transfiguration of Christ when his face and all of his garments and all began to shine. Um, Christ has that spiritual glory as he appears to John. Then John is commanded to write the things that he saw. And when I saw him, I fell down at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So John is given this uh, final... Uh, uh, words from Christ after he falls down in reverence. Fell down like a dead man, just like we saw Daniel doing when the mighty angel appeared to him. Even more so, uh, this awesome appearance of Jesus Christ the King uh, causes John to just fall down uh, before Jesus and just lose uh, all the power to move like a dead man. And we would do so also, we saw such an awesome sight. We have to use the power of our imagination to try to picture the glory of Christ that's demonstrated there. He's just overcome by awe and fear, and he collapses in fear just like you see so many of the prophets doing when they see some divine or heavenly visitor that comes to them, or they see a vision of God pictured for them on his throne like Isaiah saw. He says, Woe unto me! Uh, for I am a sinful man, and I come from a people with sinful uh, lips. And Ezekiel had a similar uh, a reaction when he saw a vision of God. So Jesus is one, though, that loves us, that gave his blood for us, and he reaches out and touches Jesus with his right, or touches John with his right hand. Uh, only the enemies need to be afraid of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Savior and our King, and John shouldn't be afraid. But what John needs to realize is that uh, Jesus Christ is the one who is the first and the last. So just like God the Father is the first and the last, he and the Son are one. So he identifies himself with that power and everlastingness that the Heavenly Father has. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share all the divine attributes with one another. So he's the first and the last whom all things come from and all things must return to. And he is in charge and you should not fear him because, of course, he's our Savior. Uh, all of us need to realize that the glorified Christ that ruling in heaven. We all need to bow our knees to him now. If we don't do it now, it's not going to do us any good when we have to do it on the last day. We need to willingly do it now and become his servants. He's totally qualified to be of comfort to John and to all of his brethren that are sharing in the tribulation. Doesn't it give you great assurance uh, to have an understanding about what Christ is? and about his power, and that he's the one that we serve. And as long as we're with him, we'll have the final victory. He is the living one who was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore. He said, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. So he is the living one. That's another divine title that's found for God in the Old Testament. He is the ever-living one. And he is the one, of course, that is uh, giving us a church that the gates of Hades shall not uh, overpower. He has already wiped out all of our enemies uh, in the past, and he'll do it in the future. And he's going to do it in John's day. This is the one that rules. He proves he has life by the fact that he was dead 
but now he's been resurrected to live forevermore. He has faithfulness. Uh, he died as a result of martyrdom, but he rose from the dead, and now he's going to be able to help all of those that may have to lay down their life for him. He's experienced the very worst of life and overcame it, and he has blazed the trail for us. He died, suffered agony at the cross, but he came back to life. And no matter what happens to the church, he's been through it already, and he's able to help us. And he is the living one that is with us. We have a living hope. Jesus said, I have the keys of death and Hades. Keys represent, figuratively speaking, power, authority. They exercise the power to open from without, to bind and to loose. And he has the way uh, to let us free both body and soul from the power of death and Hades. Death claims the body. Hades follows after. Uh, that's where the souls of men go after death, the unseen realm of Hades. And the Lord Jesus Christ was not held by death and Hades, but he overcame them at the resurrection. And like Samson, you know, could pull up those gates at Gaza and carry them away. Jesus Christ overcame death and Hades and he took the keys with him and he's able to give great comfort to all of those that serve him. He has the power over both death and Hades in the end. Um, humans are limited by death and Hades. Christ removes those limitations. He removes our fear of death. He was raised and he tells us, of course, in this vision that we should not worry. So John then is commanded to write, Write, therefore, the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things. And as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, the seven candlestick, or golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven churches, the se or the angel of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So write, therefore, the things that you've seen and the things which are and the things that shall take place after these things. Write the vision is that he's seen. He's got uh, uh, see the conditions of the church, church uh, uh, that they're presently in and the things that are going to follow are going to be recorded by John. And he tells us that he has in his hand the seven stars that were pictured in the power and control of Christ. He tells us what those represent, the angels of the churches. He reveals a mystery to us, that he has the angels of the churches in his hand. This is a difficult expression, and it is surprising how many different interpretations have been given about uh, the explanation that's given here that these are the angels of the churches. Uh, some view these, the word angel, of course, literally means messenger. And it can be used of human messengers or divine messengers. Of course, most often in this book, it's used about the angels, heavenly messengers. Uh, messengers from John to the churches. Some have said that it's speaking about the life of the church is the angel of the church. Some think it's uh, human messengers like uh, maybe the evangelist in the local church there that the letter was sent to and it was addressed to that uh, uh, messenger and then uh, to the church itself. And we have examples where John the Baptist was uh, a messenger that God sent, a special messenger. Um, so the word messenger is used for human beings, but it could be talking about angels of the church. In, a, in the book of Revelation, you find angels of the bottomless pit, angels of the waters, angels of fire, angels of the wind, and they represent and, uh, you know, the, the thing that they're over, like they're associated with the thing that they're over and God's, uh, God's control of it. Some say, Maybe it's the ideal representation of that thing. Is its angel that is represented was a Jewish concept that they had in those days, and so the, the it's like the uh, spirit of the church, the character of the church is the angel of each of the congregations. Their their spiritual character, their inward state, their 
prevailing spirit that they have is the spirit of the church or the angel of the church. As you look at the letters, they're addressed to the churches, and the spirit says that they should heed the things that are written to the churches, but the, each letter is addressed to the angel of the church. Well, the angel of the church must be in some way the spiritual life of the church because they're the ones they write to, and it's the church that is to hear what is written to the angel of the church. So the Lord is in complete control of the life of the church, uh, of the destiny of the church, and what it ought to be. And uh, the vision assures and warns the church that he holds them in his hand. He holds their life in his hands, just like uh, uh, Belshazzar was told that God holds your life's breath in his hands. Well, he holds the angel of the churches in his hands. Uh, he clasps them with the uh, idea that he's, he's holding a table. It's not like grasping something small, but it's totally securing. As long as we submit, he holds us in his hand. And, of course, I mean, we can choose to walk out. But as long as we stay faithful to him, we're in his hand and we are secure. No external force can, you know, take us away. Seven lampstands are the seven churches, perfect and complete. He walks among these churches. The lampstands uphold the light. That's our duty and responsibility to hold forth the gospel light. Uh, he walks among the lampstands. He's active. He's always present. He's among us, shows he's with us, and the things are in his control and care. His presence is everywhere with every church, and isn't that a comfort? And this is something, again, that all of us to remember. He's with us always, even to the end of the age. We don't stand alone when we uh, stand before Caesar or someone else, and they're threatening us. We might appear to be alone, but we're not alone. Well, I hope these things will be an encouragement to all of us, and then we can take up each of those seven letters to the seven churches as we continue our study.